Good day, everybody. Today, I am uh, interviewing Dr. Christos Carazios, an infectious disease specialist in the pediatric department of the Montreal Children's Hospital. Um, and he will be answering um, and demystifying all the tricks and all the myths on COVID-19, on how, how to treat it, and also uh, how to hopefully one day beat it. So, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you, Dr. Carazios, for, uh, for being here and thanking you for everything that all of you and all of the hospital staff and everybody who's in the front line fighting this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I hope that uh, you know answering the, the questions that you uh, that you will put forth might uh, help de-stress a lot of people. Um, you know we're, we're going through crazy times right now. Probably will never live this. Hopefully, never ever have to live another pandemic like this again. Um, it's never guaranteed, but uh, yeah, we are, we're all living through what's called, we're all going to have post-traumatic stress, but right now, everybody, especially physicians, are living through pre-traumatic stress. So hopefully, let's get the questions, the answers out there. Maybe people will have more concerns afterwards. I hope not, but I think it's mostly going to be a, a relaxing um, and a hopeful message that I can give out. Right, and that is my hope here, too. And yeah. this is why I'm doing it. And also, I think we should note that, you know, the questions that are answered today, hopefully will, you know, be the answers that can still be the same a few months from now. But some yes. might change as we get to learn this, this virus a little more. We get to know it a little better, correct? Yes, 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 of course. Okay. So uh, I asked a few of, uh, you know, my followers if they had a few questions and a lot of came in and everybody's very grateful for all the uh the, the time you're putting into this to answer all these questions. So thank you for that as well. My so, pleasure. That's what I'm here for. People don't touch your faces. I'm noticing myself doing it over and over again. It's very, very hard, but my hands are clean. I have my, my, my Steri gel here. Uh, so that's one point and one key point that I need to pass on to everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. So yeah. uh, concerning treatment drugs, there's many ph pharmaceutical companies are in the race to get drugs out both for immediate treatment and as a future vaccine. When will these treatment drugs be used to help us here locally? Okay. So we'll start off with the vaccine because that's an easier uh, answer than, uh, than, than the drugs, the treatment drugs. Um, a vaccine <clears throat> doesn't get ready and doesn't get produced within a few weeks. Um, a vaccine requires, uh, you know, to be developed, to be tested on healthy subjects, and then to see if these healthy subjects um, are infected or can get infected or not. It also um, has to do with safety. Uh, is it a safe vaccine? Does it have side effects? Uh, you know, most vaccine development nowadays is very, very safe, but we always have to take that extra step to make sure that uh, we don't uh, that we don't give a vaccine that has um, that has side effects out there. Um, I think uh, you know. Let's see. About a month ago, an Israeli group was the closest that I've ever seen for a vaccine, or the earliest group that would probably come out with a vaccine. And uh, because they already were were working on a um, a veterinary preparation for a vaccine against animal coronaviruses. And so um, they, all they had to do is they said, all they had to do is tweak it for human uh, uh, trials and uh, that they were going to be ready within weeks, they said. So I'm still waiting for that announcement. Um, of course, there's m many other companies uh, across the world. Um, you know, the, the Pasteur Institute in France, there's also the NIH here in the United States, Canada. We're, many, many groups are working with um, uh, to, to get vaccines going. Don't forget, a vaccine is not a cure. A vaccine is a preventative measure. So it would have to be given to people who are not already infected. Okay. Uh, you, right. So to prevent them from getting the disease. It's not having to do anything with somebody who is already infected. Um, it's possible that with, just like with the flu, um, we would need, you know, boosters often because it's a vaccine that won't confer immunity forever. I don't know. 
Um, also, we don't know the characteristics of this coronavirus. Uh, I'll call it SARS-2 coronavirus because it is the second SARS-type coronavirus that's out there. Um, you know, is it going to be a mutating virus? So every year, every couple of years, it comes back as another form and the vaccine that we got didn't work. So again, these are all questions that are still looked at. And I don't think a true vaccine is going to be ready before winter next year. Well, I mean, you know, 2020. Right. And In terms of medications now. So there are a handful, but enough, uh, medications that are out there right now, there is investigational drugs. There are investigational drugs, sort of the anti-HIV drugs that are, uh, Kaletra is one major one that people are talking about. There's a medication that was, that was used for Ebola called Remdesivir. And this is, a, this is another medication that is used for experimental purposes. So these patients um, are usually in studies. Um, and then there's a variety of other uh, antivirals, uh, not many, but again, these are study drugs. So mm. you can't just get it like that and give it. Then there is the standard of care protocol. And the standard of care protocol that we at our center are working on, um, and I'm part of the pediatric uh, standard of care pro protocol team, um, is that famous Antimalarial that you might be hearing of, uh, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil is the other name for that medication. Um, its cousin chloroquine has also been used. Uh, it's not. It's 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 a, it's got a little bit more um, toxicity, uh, and uh, the tolerability is not as good. And um, uh, chloroquine uh, also is not as bioavailable, meaning that when you take it by mouth, it doesn't get absorbed to a good level. So you have to give higher doses to get absorbed and therefore you get your intolerances and stuff like that. Hydroxychloroquine, its cousin, seems to have a better bioavailability and a better uh, tolerability and safety profile. Um, this medication was used uh, in the lab against the virus in China and it showed that it decreased uh, viral activity and again, in human trials. And the most, um, you know, the most, uh, I guess, hopeful trial that came out was a group from Marseille, uh, a group headed by Dr. Raoult uh, in Marseille. Um, it was a small study, only 20 patients uh, given hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. And maybe many people will recognize the name. It's a lot of people who have lupus, for instance, are on Plaquenil. But it's an anti-parasitic. It's an anti-malarial drug. We have decades of experience with this drug. So anyway, so they took that drug and they gave it to 20 patients who had uh, SARS-2, uh, CoV. And uh, basically, if the patients, so 14 patients who only got the chloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine, decreased their viral numbers in their nose and in their pharynx, 50% of those patients decreased it by six days. It's a six-day treatment. There are six patients that were given that in combination with a medication called azithromycin, so Zithromax or the z -Pak. Now, this is a medication that you may also be aware of. It's an antibacterium, a bacterial, it's an anti it's an antibiotic, basically, that is being used to treat, you know, pneumonias, ear infections, etc. Especially people who are allergic to penicillin get put on this. Um, so it's a one pill once a day kind of thing, or for kids, it's a one syrup once a day um, for six days. And that, in combination with the hydroxychloroquine, the six patients that were given both of those, 100% of them, so all six, actually cleared the virus within six days from their nose and from their pharynx. So last week they released it online. They, um, they sent it the way it's usually done when you have your uh, manuscript, you send it to a journal and you wait for them to accept it or not. But they decided to release it online uh, and uh, on a YouTube presentation because of ethical reasons, they said, because time is running out. So they released this small study. Of course, whenever you have a small study in medicine, you always have to take that with a grain of salt because you have to say, is it by chance that those six patients did that? If we, if we did this, um, to a hundred patients, will a hundred of them get this or will we start seeing failures? So this is why a lot of the people are skeptical. I know um, 
Donald Trump picked up that ball and started to run with it. And Anthony Fauci and the rest of them were sort of like, okay, you know, calm down. And, um, you know, we have to look at it. But this is becoming the standard of care protocol in many hospitals uh, across the world right now. We are looking at to see whether it's going to be effective. So, again, it only started to come out last week. The protocols are still in development. We at the, at the, the McGill University Health Center, the adult protocol is in phase. The Children's Hospital, we um, did treat a child uh, with this uh, over the weekend. So we have to wait and see what the results are. Um, you know, I don't want to go into the details too much about patients, but you know, the, the whether or not the child is a true positive or or, or, or a negative, we can discuss it later on with testing questions. But um, we're hopeful that over the next couple of days or a few days, we're going to have some results to actually show and say, hey, listen, this patient got better. You know, there are, there are a few reports that I just read that people are uh, self-administering some of these yeah. drugs, and it's yeah. quite dangerous. Right. So right. to be to be frank and to be blunt, uh, I mean everybody's scared, right? I mean, and I understand. I understand. This is, uh, you know, this is something that we can't see. This is something that we are afraid we're going to die of. You know, even though the overall mortality is 06 percent, if we think, if we look at all the, the the countries in the world that have tested the most, like South Korea, they can have a better representation of what the mortality level is, and so 06 percent. But if we break it down into age groups. People over, um, you know, 80 years old have a 12 to 20 percent mortality rate. So one in five people will die if they're over 80 years old. So of course people are panicking. I can understand. But to paraphrase a friend of mine, there's a lot of stupid out there. So this this guy and his wife uh, was it in Oklahoma? Yeah, uh, went and unfortunately bought aquarium cleaner. And aquarium cleaner contains chloroquine in it. And so they ingested it, thinking that they could be protected. Again. I don't know how long, not sure the details. I don't know if they were taking a little bit every day to prevent them. They had no clue what they were doing, and they ended up dying. One of the major side effects of these chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine drugs is cardiac arrhythmias. So, you know, and also when you put it in combination with the azithromycin, the cardiac arrhythmias go up because both azithro and hydroxychloroquine um, have a risk of arrhythmias. So if we're going to treat a patient, we're going to treat them in hospital, we're going to monitor their cardiac activity. If you're going to go and hoard these medications and take them yourself like crazy without a guidance, then you might have fatal arrhythmia and die. So, you know, I think it's irresponsible of, uh, of it would be irresponsible of me to go out and say it's the cure because we don't know. We're very, very... Um, encouraged by the results out of Marseille, but it's only six patients. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, so that, that answers, I think, a lot of the questions with the, uh, with the drugs that we have out there. There's also, are you doing anything to build up immune systems? There's a drug out there that I'd heard from Cuba uh, that is already used for HIV patients, already used for, I, I believe it was uh, also, well, cancer patients as well. Uh, so there's no... Yeah, there's no real, uh, the data is not strong, let's put it this way. We're looking at all possibilities. There's really nothing that, you know, a lot of people think, let's take something to boost my immune system. One of the questions further down, I think, is vitamin C and, um, and all this uh, kind of play, uh, I think, that you had sent me. Right. Um, really, the, the way to boost your immune system is to get enough rest, to eat well properly, and to have a balanced diet. That's the only way. If you are a patient who you cannot boost your immune system because you are on chemotherapy or you know, you're a bone marrow transplant patient or you have an immunodeficiency like HIV or something like that and it's out of control, then there really isn't a magic bullet for you. You have to stay away and try not to get this virus. And how, are we, how is the hospital protecting these patients that are coming in or are already in the hospital? So the hospital since last week has uh, has effectively locked down. No visitors allowed. Um, if you you know if any of your if any of your listeners come and show up at the hospital uh, over the next few days, you they'll see that the entrances are all blocked. 
you are being siphoned into one, one or you know, a couple of entrances here and there. There are security guards there with, uh, it looks almost like you're going through the airport, you know, when you come back from wherever at Dorval, uh, at uh, uh, Trudeau, and uh, you know, you wait in line. Um, so they, they call you over, they say, do you have, you know, do you have any fever? They stop the travel questions. Have you traveled in the last 14 days? They stop that because we are suspecting that there is community spread right now. So it doesn't really matter where you're coming from. So essentially, do you have any symptoms? And the symptoms are cough, fever, sore throat, runny nose, diarrhea, all of the above or any of the above. So if you have any of that, they identify you, they put you aside, there's another table and they start asking you questions. Um, if they feel that you do not need to be there, then uh, you are asked to go home. Uh, if they feel that you are not need to be there and you are ill looking, uh, then they will either direct you to the emergency room or there is a, uh, we have drive-in. Now we have, since yesterday and today, drive-in uh, non-appointment um, uh, testing areas and uh, where you are assessed by a health professional a swab is done and then you are either sent home or you know you don't look good come in and so that's the that's the situation um, anybody who does not have business at the hospital is not allowed in the hospital okay so this is this is how so one this is one way to keep disease outside of the hospital from coming inside the hospital. Some people lie. Unfortunately, there have been patients who have lied because they don't want to miss their appointments and they're coughing and it's an essential appointment because most clinics are canceled except essential clinics. So HIV clinics, for instance, I do HIV clinic, I haven't canceled. I've pushed a lot of patients six months ahead if they're stable, but you know, newborns and anything that I need to see, they're coming in at a, at a, at a more frequent, uh, you know, uh, visit uh, schedule but um, you know you if you don't have business you are not yeah and so patients lie and they you know unfortunately I opened the door and to walked into one of the patient's rooms last week and the patient was coughing without a mask and I started to get I got upset at the mother I said why did you lie oh I was afraid you were gonna throw us out no we're not gonna treat you like lepers we are not going to throw you out I just need to know that I need to be protected before I walk in because if I get sick and I'm gone for two weeks and that means somebody else has to take over all my stuff. And we're already starting to stack up on work. I mean, we're really busy. Um, and lot, lots, of, lots of physicians are off because they are traveled recently. So they're off for 14 days. And some physicians have unfortunately gotten sick. Uh, so they're off. So we are, you know, trying to plug in the holes. Um, once a patient is admitted with COVID in the hospital, um, if they need aerosol generating procedures, meaning deep suctioning, you know, a ventilation on a machine, anything that will create aerosols, they are put into a, a isolation room uh, with the pressure, it's called a negative pressure, which means that the room is negative to the outside. So everything from the outside gets sucked into the patient's room and out the exhaust, out into the, into the environment, there's a filter to not allow things to escape into the environment, but that's how, that's how it is everywhere around the world. Um, if a patient is admitted who has mild symptoms of COVID and needs, to, you know, needs a little bit of oxygen, not a machine to work, at, or not a breathing apparatus, then that patient is put into an isolation room as well, but the, the pressure is not necessarily um, negative all the time, and the physicians don't have to wear well, you know, the hazmat suits, but we do wear you know, our goggles and our, and, and, a, and a, just a simple surgical mask, gloves and a gown. Okay. And these uh, drive-through testing sites, anybody can go? Anybody can go. No appointments? There's, from what I understand, there's the one, um, the one near Place des Arts, at Place des Spectacles, uh, or Place des Fêtes, whatever it's called, there is no appointment. And I do believe that there's no appointment in these here as well. So if people, if people, um, know the children's and the, the the royal vic a little bit the glen when you go in to go down to the emergency room there's a down level it's kind of like going down into a parking lot at an airport underneath then you see like the you know the the, the children's emergency room signs and then signs for the royal vic it's there you will see uh, there's orange cones and like strings and they will direct you in and you just wait in line you might have to get out of your car uh to go and get assessed but still that's i, I don't think you need an appointment 
What is the one piece? For now, but, but for now, I have to mention they're not seeing children. Children are still being um, uh, seen if they need to be in the emergency room. We're trying to, you know, growing pains. We're trying to get people to, 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 to accept kids as well. What is the one key symptom that you feel uh, differentiates COVID-19 symptoms from either a flu, a cold, or people with already respiratory distress like asthma? Asthma is asthma. People get asthmatic attacks for various reasons. Um, I think that it's very, very hard right now to differentiate the regular flu from, from COVID-19 symptoms. Sure, the vast majority of COVID-19 patients have high fever, body aches, and a, and a dry cough, not a wet cough, a dry cough. But, you know, every day we're hearing, you know, as we test more people and results start coming back more, if you look for the virus, you'll find it. It's out there. This is why the numbers are going up and up and up and up. Don't worry about that. The important thing is the deaths and the severe cases because up and up and up, we are able to quarantine and trace people um, as opposed to the deaths and the, and the uh, you know, the, the, the severe cases. So as we are learning more about the symptoms of these people that are testing positive, we're understanding that Many of them just have diarrhea. Many of them just have a little bit of a runny nose. So this is why the differential is very broad. But the vast majority of patients who do come in with you know, the, the severe symptoms or really bad symptoms are high fever and a cough and difficulty breathing. Okay, and is there enough testing kits for everybody? Like in a perfect, no, there isn't. So in a perfect no. world though, if we had all the testing kits available, yeah. would it, would, would, and we don't know, maybe that in the future will happen. Would that be ideal to know that even the non, you know, symptomatic people yeah. who has it and who hasn't, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, the, uh, you know, right now we do have testing kits. They're there. We have them. But we're running low. You know, these things, you know, they don't, it doesn't, it's not overnight that they're made. We're trying to get companies to give them to us. Many places in the world are holding it to themselves. Um, a lot of these manufacturing places are in China and China is all cut down now, right? So, um, so we are reserving it for patients that we need. We are not testing anybody for the flu anymore. We're not testing anybody. It's like, is it going to change management? No. And, you know, for any patient who comes in who's like really severe, they get flu medications as well. They get Tamiflu um, blindly because it could just be the flu as well. And this is why you cannot differentiate between. But unfortunately, we, we have to, we cannot test everything for everybody. Um, and we're reserving it for those that we feel need COVID testing. Okay. For so now. A little, someone a little more critical than your typical nose sniffle or sort of Well, any admit, I think any, any patient that you're going to admit into hospital <clears throat> or a healthcare worker that is working with patients that you really need to know if they've got COVID, then yes, you will test them. And any patient who's in hospital, because it has to do with infection control. If they just have, oh, I don't know, para-influenza virus or respiratory syncytial virus, who cares, right? They can get off isolation and leave that room open for a real COVID patient. Okay. So any admitted patient and anybody who is at high risk um, of developing serious disease or a healthcare worker would need to have these tests done. Okay, can a regular flu vaccine that we get, you know, the standard yeah. flu vaccine, can that help at all with the distress of the symptoms of COVID-19? No, the, the, the influenza vaccine is very specific for the influenza virus, period. Um, it does not prevent, does not help treat, and does not alleviate the symptoms of COVID. What it can do is actually maybe prevent you from getting the flu, so you don't get sick with the flu and think that you may have COVID. Um, or, you know, as it usually, uh, usually happens, uh, you know, people get the flu, they're run down, their immune system is run down, they're not being very careful with their hygiene practices, and then they get infected with COVID, and then they really get sick. So that is the only reason to get the flu shot. Right now, though, there's no more flu shots. I would be very surprised if you can find an influenza vaccine somewhere. Okay. Because they've been out since October and they're they're used, right? And we're coming close to the flu season end. Usually by May, the activity of the flu season really goes down to zero. April, it starts to trickle down. 
So if the flu ends like that, why wouldn't the COVID-19 end? Right. Great question. Um, the COVID-19 is a, is a coronavirus that we've never, ever seen before. The human race has no natural immunity to this virus. There's a difference between epidemic yearly influenza that kind of resembles last year's influenza that people kind of humanity kind of has some immunity memory of having influenza so the disease is not as serious and is not as easily transmissible to others than a pandemic where it's a completely fresh virus nobody has seen this virus there's absolutely no immunity and the vaccine and the <clears throat> excuse me and the virus just you know spreads like wildfire in the community okay. so the reason why respiratory viruses typically go down in transmissibility during the winter is because we open up our windows we step outside we are not locked in with a bunch of people kids stop going to school i call you know daycares and schools bioterrorist camps because these kids are bioterrorists they get everything and they come bring it home to mom and dad so you know this is the reason why a lot of the respiratory viruses go away in the summertime and they come back later on don't forget that the southern hemisphere has winter when we have summer so flu goes down to the southern hemisphere mutates a little bit and then comes back up to us mutates then goes back down this is how the flu works a pandemic is year round and we don't know it's possible that you know if we start you know if the if the the sun is out more and we're less crowded in in in, in, in spaces and we open up our windows air our houses a little bit more maybe the maybe this is going to go down and there's a suspicion that perhaps it's going to start to but in a pandemic, if, if anything, if history has shown us anything, in 1918, the big influenza, Spanish flu pandemic, the second wave, there were three waves. The second wave came in August. It started in Brest in France, and then it spread like wildfire through Africa, August, where you know, everything is burning up in August. So I don't think we can predict how uh, the dynamics of an influenza, pan um, well, yes, of an influenza pandemic, because the, the 1918 and the 2009 H1N1 spread through the summer as well but now this one covid uh, i don't think we can be as cavalier as some people are and say oh it's going to go away in the summertime we don't know we just don't know and it might come back with a vengeance in in the fall so we have to buy time to get these treatment protocols to, to, to make sure that they work buy time to get a vaccine uh to prevent <clears throat> this from happening again are you confident to say as of today that we have flattened the curve or when, or or do you know when we can confidently state that i don't think we can say that yet i think we are looking at we are only the first week of extreme measures um then the, this allows us to test more people because a they're not in school or they're not at work so they can actually come and get tested b uh, they are not at school and not at work transmitting to others. So once they start having symptoms, they can come and get tested. So the tests, the testing capacity has done this. So the curve is doing this right now. What, I'm, what we have to see is the severe cases and the deaths because it starts, if, if it's starting to look like this, then we are successful in flattening the curve. Um, Italy, Spain, the United States, China, Iran, they didn't do enough before the curve started to do this. And you can see the deaths are, the, I mean, Italy is still like this. It's starting to, there's some hope, but it's just the first day where the number of deaths have started to go down. So I think here in Quebec, which I have to commend, uh, I have to commend Premier Legault. I have to commend um, Dr. Horacio Aruda, the public health, uh, the top doc here in Quebec leading the COVID planning uh, uh, stages, I, they've done an excellent job, excellent compared to the rest of Canada, compared to the, to, to the rest of North America. Uh, they really, you know, brought that hammer down. We could, we could still do more. If we start seeing the curve not do this, and we start seeing more and more deaths or, you know, a lot more transmissions, then it's very, very possible that we will go into a full lockdown with you know, 
the War Measures Act, where you know the army is out there, the police is out there, um, etc. I mean, there's a few countries in the world that have done that. China did that. Um, India is doing that today. Uh, Greece has done it. I'm very actually, I'm also very, very, very um, impressed with the Greek response. Uh, they have also been very, very quick. Uh, Dr. Sotiris Chiodras, a um, Harvard medical uh, graduate who is advising the uh, prime minister, is doing an excellent job. So. You know, the prime minister or the leader of a country is only as good in this as their advisors are. And these advisors have been, have been doing an excellent job. So, you know, complete lockdown and we'll have to see. But uh, the, 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 the important thing is, is that lockdown has to happen earlier rather than later before transmissions start to happen like crazy in the, in the community. So it's too soon. We can have another podcast next week if you'd like. Uh, and we can update. <clears throat> on the numbers, but I'm 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 confident that we did things fairly quickly, at least here in Quebec. There's uh, there, it was reported that in Taiwan, uh, they were successful in slowing down uh, the COVID nineteen spread without these extreme measures. They uh, gave out sanitizer and masks right away. They uh, created dividers for their students. Schools did not shut down. Businesses did not shut down. Uh, do you think it's too early that they were successful? Because so far it looks good, but what, what, what makes the difference between what we're doing and what they did? So that's, again, it's a very good question. The, the, what it comes down to is the capacity of a country to, to conduct numbers of tests. The numbers that are being released out there are not true numbers. Wherever you see a number of confirmed cases, not deaths or ICU, severe, you know, ventilated patients, severely ill patients. We know those numbers. Those are, those are given. <clears throat> Unless there's patients dying at home, like in Spain, and they don't, you know, they're not sure of the dead yet. But what I'm talking about is patients that have, that we have, that we, that we know are sick or dead. We know that number. What we don't know is the denominator of how many people out there in society are sick. If we take South Korea that has done probably the most testing because they were very quick in getting the tests out and locking down and doing whatever you know needed to be to, to be done testing 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 and quarantining patients you know they've tested over almost close to 300,000 patients the mortality that they found was 0.6% okay so that means that for every death there's probably about 100 to 200 other cases out there if we're gonna think about the 0.6% mortality. Statistically, there's about 100 to 200 cases for that one death. So if you count the number of dead in a country, multiply that by 150, let's say, and that probably is close to the real number of infected people out there. So whatever you know, Taiwan has reported, uh, we always have to take it with a grain of salt. I don't know the, the percentage of people in Taiwan that have been tested. That's number one. Number two, Taiwan and China are not very good um, friends, okay? They're both Chinese, but, you know, each one considers the other one a rogue nation. And when China became communist, the government, that, the democratic government that was in Beijing fled to Taipei, and they created the Republic of China. And for years, they were called the Republic of China, and uh, the other one was called the Democratic Republic of China, Democratic People's Republic of China. And anyway, now China is China, and Taiwan is according to China, still China, but you know, for the rest of the world, it's Taiwan. So they, they're not friends. So I don't think there's much travel happening between those two countries. Uh, compared to, let's say, Chinese um, tourists that flock to Europe, uh, that go to Italy, um, Chinese businessmen that went to the Milan Fashion Week um, at the end of February, uh, and transmitted it to those people there. So that's, that's a second theory that I have as to why Taiwan did not see so many imported cases. Taiwan also did um, <clears throat> flight lockdowns and flight, uh, you know, and, and quarantines for people coming into the country. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, things that you have to look at in a country as to why that one is so bad compared to the other country. Interestingly enough, in South Korea, the majority of the patients that are being um, infected are young, and uh, it, the tip is a little bit more toward women getting infected. Women smoke less than men uh, overall, 
and, uh, and young people do not have bad lungs compared to older people. China had it so bad because, you know, 60% of men in China smoke. China, especially Wuhan, is a very, very polluted country, very polluted city. So these older people have been breathing this bad air for years and they're smoking. And so in somebody who this COVID would have caused a simple bronchiolitis, bronchitis, cough, you know, goes away after a couple of weeks, these people are in the ICU and dying. What happened in Italy, Italy has 15% of its population is over 65. So it has affected disproportionate number of elderly in Italy. The United States is also seeing a lot of old people uh, falling ill and dying, but they're also reporting younger individuals. Uh, we have to look at those numbers. Obesity is a risk factor for, uh, for dying in uh, COVID-19 because you have all this massive weight on you and you can't breathe, so you are put on a ventilator. And uh, there's a huge vaping epidemic in the United States. So a lot of the youth that have been vaping have been damaging their lungs over the last couple of years, and there you go. So you have to look at the populations that, that this virus affects. And, uh, you know, this is why I, um, you know, looking at the elderly, you know, Greece, Greeks here are also have a very large percentage of our population being elderly. Um, you know, in Greece, uh, there's a lot of smokers, uh, 30 to 40 percent of, uh, of, of, of Greece smokes. Uh, and if you look at men, it's up to 50, 60 percent. So this is where I was worried about. And this is why Greece probably took those measures very quickly, because they know their healthcare system does not have the ICU beds that we have here. Um, and, uh, and even here, we don't have the ICU beds that we need. So um, this is why I was very, very concerned. And I started calling two weeks ago, actually. I started calling the Greek community centers here in Toronto, Vancouver, getting the word out to cancel parades, uh, you know, the Independence Day parade tomorrow uh, on, for the 25th of March, cancel uh, any kind of dances, community dances, any kind of celebrations. Um, I even spoke to the archbishop to, to, to close the churches. Uh, that came uh, about a week uh, after I spoke to him with um, uh, orders from uh, from the Fanar in Constantinople and from the Patriarch. So at least we did our best to try to do what we can locally here, you know? That's amazing. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for, for, for... And the schools. And the, the Socrati schools, yeah. Thank you for informing our leaders and uh, they took measures seriously and they did what they needed to do. Yeah. Um, so La PES just reported that there are estimating 18,000 new cases within a month. Yeah. Uh, what are your predictions on that? And are you worried about uh, creating, with all these numbers, you know, people are going to start getting scared when they start seeing the numbers go up, uh, creating like a mass hysteria, and then people are getting tested and, you know, it creates this whole overload of the hospitals. And Right. So the first thing is... Um, I don't know where the numbers are going to go. I cannot predict. I can only say that I feel that whatever numbers we are getting are not true because there's a lot more people out there that are being that are not tested because we're only testing people who have traveled recently and you know um, up until a couple of days ago where these open travel clinics now, they, these drive-through clinics, but they ask you questions, I guess. I don't know what the questions that they ask you are. Perhaps some of them are, you know, if you have a little bit of a, okay, don't get tested, you know, they'll say bye-bye, but you may have COVID, you don't know. And many children have asymptomatic disease. They, you know, they're, and they're shedding it because they're bioterrorists. They pick their noses and they go and they touch or they sneeze on you. And that, that's, how it, that's how it is. So we don't know the true value, the true number. Um, it may go to 18,000, it may go more. Don't panic. The reason why I'm saying don't panic is because 80% of, the, of, the, of, the, of these patients will have mild to no disease. The numbers are going up because we are testing more. If you look for something, you will find it. Where we should start to panic and worry is if we start seeing ICU numbers go up, severe cases go up, and deaths go up. That is important to look at. And that we, you know, yesterday there was a, two days ago, there was a huge climb in the number of deaths, four or five deaths that happened. Uh, you know, there was a few deaths in a nursing home. Um, hopefully, over the next few days, we don't see a spike in deaths. Um, Italy's spikes in deaths are, is doing this. We're not there yet. You know, there was like one death in all of Canada overnight or two deaths. It's not, you know, hopefully we are 
flattening that death curve. So let's say someone is waiting for a test, which it seems to take a few days to get the results. No, so it should far. take 24 hours. It should now take 24, 24 hours. Great. It's, yeah, um, it's getting a better, well, it okay, takes 24 good. hours from lab to lab, and then it has to do with co uh, connecting to you and telling you the test. But we're working on tests that take hours, like four hours, not 24. Okay, so let's say they are diagnosed with it, but their symptoms are truly mild. They're told to be isolated yes. and all that. Uh, what, what symptom, do they have it? What would they have in order to go to merit an emergency visit or switch it up? Is it a fever? Is it a combination of a fever and a cough? Like, what is it that would make them have to go to the emergency and seek help? Right. So there's a 1877 number that people can look up. 1877 COVID. Um, I can't remember the actual number myself. I can look it up while I'm here. Do you want me to look it up? Um, I'll, I'll post it afterwards. Fine. Um, and there's 811, which of course takes two hours to get through to somebody, but they, they're training new people to answer the phones as much as possible or going to these drive-in clinics. Um, the test takes five minutes. I posted it on my Facebook uh, publicly. You can share that if you'd like, how the test, what the test looks like. Basically, it's a pipe cleaner. Uh, not, as, not as hard as a pipe cleaner. It's actually quite soft. It's like a, it's like a soft noodle that has a little brush at the end. We stick it down your nose. We twirl it and we pull it out and it feels like a wasabi hit. It feels like, you know, when you go and you eat sushi and you take wasabi and it goes up your nose so, or like a hot mustard or hot, uh, or horseradish. It's transient. It takes about three seconds and it goes away. You'll tear a little bit and that's it. That's the test. Um, what would make you go to the emergency room? Okay. So if you are an immune suppressed individual, you should go and seek medical help and you have a cough or a fever, you should be anyway, right? If you're a, you know, a cancer patient whose neutrophils or white cells are down because of chemotherapy and you suddenly get fever, you should go to see a, hospital, to, to see a doctor in the hospital. You know, this is standard, everybody tells you this. You know, if you're a neonate, uh, anybody, any, any child less than, especially any child less than six weeks of age should go see somebody, a hospital. Any child less than three months of age should speak to their pediatrician, not necessarily go to the hospital, but you know, three months, let me go back, make it easy for everybody. Three months and, and three months and less, go see somebody. Emergency. Immunosuppressed patient that you know you're immunosuppressed and you get a fever or you have a cough or whatever, you should go see somebody. Call ahead to the emergency room or call ahead uh, or just go and triage and say, listen, I am a cancer patient. I've got fever. I've got cough. I need to, you know. Um, if you are somebody that has a severe cardiac problem or lung issues, uh, so really bad asthma, cystic fibrosis, et cetera, and you get a cough and a fever, you should go see somebody. Um, if you're over 80 uh, and you have underlying medical conditions, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, any of the above, uh, you should go see somebody. And then what I mean see somebody is you should go to the emergency room. Um, now, for everybody else who is not that sick, you know, a little bit of a runny nose, a little bit of a cough, a little bit of a this. You don't need to go and see somebody. If you want to go get tested because you really need to know, you might be a physician or you might be living with somebody who's got uh, a high risk condition, um, then you can go to one of these clinics and get tested. But you're supposed to go home, isolate yourself in one part of the house, and people should bring you the food. You should use one toilet, not, you know, not, or if you only have one toilet in the house, then you should, um, you know, use bleach to clean the toilet bowl, uh, put, you know, bleach inside, clean everything with bleach. Um, so for the next person doesn't get infected. Um, when you flush the toilet, because diarrhea is a problem with COVID, you should close the lid and flush the toilet and, and then clean everything uh, because the backwash contains uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, Keep the door closed when you're using the toilet, obviously. Um, use your own dedicated towel, your own dedicated bed, your own dedicated bed sheets until you know that you are COVID negative. Um, you know, that being said, I did mention that all the 80 year olds and stuff, I suppose that if you are a healthy 80 year old, you may call these 1877 numbers so they can help you and guide you. I don't want to push every 80 year old who is you know, running a marathon and never smoked in their lives to go into the emergency room. So you always have to keep 
some kind of clinical judgment yourself and say, and, and common sense and say, listen, I have a bit of a sore throat. Let me see what happens. I'm, I'm a healthy 80 year old who, you know, did, was Mr. Olympia uh, 20 years ago, you know? So, but if you are an 80 year old that has lung problems, renal failure, asthmatic, uh, you know, these, these, you know, these kind of situations. Yeah. I think these people should be seen sooner rather than later. So I have a few questions, as you know, on social media information, is yes. not, there's a lot of true, there's a lot of false people are getting confused and people are sharing and it, it could put, you know, lives at risk because they're right. getting false information. So I'm just going to go through a few uh, quick questions. I'm doing, uh, because I've been touching my nose. I'm doing yeah. this over and over again, just to let you guys know, don't worry. And my wrists, <laughs> that's how you, and my nails. And there we go. And then you Perfect. wait till they dry and then you're good. Okay. Mm. Now I can touch my nose as much as I want. <laughs> Some quick yes and no's. Okay. So, yeah. um, the di okay. These are things that are going around social media. Okay. So right. some of them are ridiculous. Some are not so ridiculous. Some, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say all of them. The Taiwan right, doctor states, if you can't hold your breath for 10 seconds, it's the first sign of COVID-19. BS. Okay. Drinking hot beverages kills the virus. BS. Eating cold will increase your chances of getting infected. BS. Dogs get infected with COVID-19. Dogs can get dog coronavirus. I don't think we know. I know that there may have been coronavirus isolated from a dog. Look, I, I don't know that, but they cannot get COVID-19 that I know of. Okay. They, can, they can carry it, but I don't, I think it's human specific. I have to look at that. Okay. Uh, saunas kill the virus. No, they don't. We're, we live in, we, our bodies are 37 degrees. When we have COVID, we can go up to 40 degrees. People who say that the virus dies above 27 degrees, what are they talking about? How does it live inside us? It's a different story if it's on a surface and the sun is beating on it every day. It'll kill pretty much everything within a, you know, within a, a day or so on a solid surface. But you can't make statements like that and say, you know, above a certain temperature in a sauna, it's not going to be, it's going to die. Okay, so I'll assume blow dryers blowing up. Uh, how do, oh, yeah, blow, blow dryers <laughs> in your nose. BS. <laughs> okay, gargling antiseptic mouthwash or salt water a few times a day kills the virus. BS. The virus can get through your eyes. Okay. We need to sanitize the bottom of our shoes. Well, who's, who walks around licking the bottom of their shoes? Except my daughter, who I caught uh, a couple of weeks ago, licking her own shoes. But uh, who goes and licks shoes? Yes, there's other stuff that we should worry about underneath our shoes. But if we walk in, take off our shoes and put, leave them in the, you know, in our closet. And, you know, let's not be crazy here. So just going, because we're in that. And how, first of all, and how is COVID, how is COVID-19 on the floor? Someone coughs and and it goes on the floor and you walk on it. Yeah, but you would have probably had to, people are not walking around out in society going like this, ah, on the floor with the, you know, the spit flying directly onto the floor. That doesn't happen. In a hospital setting, I can understand, but um, you know, again, we have to take things logically. Um, you know, it's very unlikely that you're going to walk into someone's spit puddle on the in the park or on the street, um, and then that virus is going to stay on the cement and survive while you walk on it, and then survive on your soles as you're walking through salt and as you're walking through. God knows whatever gasoline spills there are out there, uh, that virus is not going to survive by the time you get home. Right. In the hospital environment, it's a different story, obviously. But uh, again, there's you know no one's sitting there touching their soles of their feet, um, uh, etc. Okay. What about uh, vegetables and fruits? Wash them with uh, with water if you are concerned. Uh, you can wash them with a mild detergent like soap and water, you know, like the dishwasher detergent, and rinse them. You don't have to go too, too crazy. Essentially, if you're buying a bag at the supermarket, just make sure to wash your hands. Okay. When you open it, wash your hands, take the, the fruit and the vegetables, wash them, you know, and then that's it. What about washing man-made masks? You know, some people have made their own masks or re-washing, wash like in the laundry or washing gloves, rubber gloves until they no. left. No. no, because you will, no, because 
you know, I know Trump said something about that a couple of days ago when I heard it. I'm like, whoa, I don't know about that. Because when you stick something into the washing machine, how do you know that when it comes out, the integrity is still there? How do you know that there's no microscopic holes being made? How do you know that uh, the plastic is not melted? How do you know? How do you know? So for now, it's disposable. What about ma like man-made meaning like uh, material, made out of material? Like fabric. Uh, fabric. But why would anybody be using fabric? I know that there's a lot of people now that are being called to sew masks because we're running low on masks. Um, maybe in a future podcast when I have more information as to what kind of fabric is a difference if it's a knitted thing where the holes are this big and you put on your face and it doesn't protect anything. And it's a difference if the fabric is like a very tough Kevlar type of fabric. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um... Should we wear gloves when shopping, grocery, no. a cart? Look, you can do whatever you want. But the thing is, is that when people wear personal protective equipment outside, they have a false sense of security that they're, that they're clean. So, for instance, you're wearing your gloves. You think that your hands are clean, but they're not. You're touching the gloves, right? The gloves, you think that the gloves are clean. And then you have this false sense of security because I'm wearing this, the virus is not on my hand itself, on my skin. I can touch here, I can touch there. Some people say, no, I'm wearing a glove, I'm not gonna touch it. But then look what happens. You take your glove off, you're wearing a glove here. You take your glove off, the palm of your hand, you're, and you're touching the palm of your hand with the glove. And then you take this glove here, and you remove, most people don't know how to remove gloves, they'll remove it like this. So then now you've contaminated your hand. But because you were wearing gloves, you think that you don't have to do this. And then, you know, you don't do this. You remove your glove, and then you touch your face, and you're done. You're infected. Same thing with a mask. Many people think you've seen them. They get tired of wearing the mask. They bring the mask. They bring it down to here. What's that going to do? All the viruses that are stuck on the outside of your mask, now you've put them on the bottom of your chin. And then you bring your mask back up. You can try to remove it, you remove it like this. It's on your hands. You don't wash your hands. You think because you're wearing a mask, then you touch your face, then you're done. You're infected. So people are saying that be super vigilant, super, super crazy about washing your hands. Walk with a, with a you know, Purell, or if you don't have Purell because it's not out there, <clears throat> find it in, a, you know, find an alcohol bottle. Put it into an old perfume sample and just spray your hands here and there every, you know, and that's it, that's all you need. Soap and water is just as fine. As long as you wash your hands before you touch your face and you shouldn't be touching your face. And be careful what you, what you touch. Doorknobs, elevator buttons, handles on the metro or handles on the bus, uh, you know, things like that. I, will, I always walk around with uh, Purell, not putting a plug on Purell, but I'm just saying, I'm walk, I always walk around with alcohol gel in my hand. And people, people are saying that there's no alcohol gels. I can give you guys a, a bit of a hint. Go to Bath and Body Works. They do have 60% alcohol stuff. And many people have not thought about going there. And they limit the amount of people that can get. And the amount of Purell, eh, the amount of alcohol gels at uh, Bath and Body Works are, um, um, are, are limited. Although I think the stores are closed right now. Yeah, it's a little sticky. A day <laughs> wait. <laughs> you can order online. Online, right? Online. Yeah. Um, so there's different reports again on how long the um, virus stay, survives on certain services. Everything's yeah. changing. You know, the on the Princess character, the Princess Cruise Line. Now they're saying it lasted up until 70 days. Uh, yeah. They're saying when you sneeze, it's airborne for three hours after someone has sneezed or coughed. That, this is why people, I guess, are, want to wear masks or they're afraid to touch that cardboard box from, uh, you know, an online store that comes to their door or their letter, yeah. letters on the mailbox. But how do we... How do we Look, do so, so people... So, okay, let me go backtrack on the mask thing again. If you are absolutely um, working with somebody... Me, for instance, I'm a physician. If you're a healthcare worker and you're working with somebody who's got COVID, you're going to wear a mask. If you are somebody who is has to take public transport and or who is in a crowded room by necessity, 
and you're like, you know, now we're social distancing. There's, we should be separated. If I, if I bring you the, the if I bring you the, the camera down to the cafeteria here, they've separated the tables, only two people at a table and they have to be two meters apart. There's like, you know, tapes and this and that. So if you are somewhere that's crowded and you cannot, then the mask might help you from getting something. But again, it's not, you know, if someone's coughing next to you, you should, first of all, they shouldn't be and you shouldn't be that close. But that mask might prevent you from inhaling something. A mask is also helpful if you are sick because you're coughing, so it's stuck on the inside of the mask and not out there. Um, now, in terms of coughing, coughing is not necessarily an aerosol generating procedure. It produces wet, big drops. They go like this and they fall down. They, they travel about almost two meters and they fall down. This is where the two meter rule is. Um, they'll fall down to the floor or onto a table or whatever. This is why respiratory etiquette means that you sneeze into your elbow or if you've got a, a handkerchief, you sneeze into the handkerchief and you throw it into the garbage and you wash your hands. Um, and that whole idea of living three hours and stuff, that's when you have an aerosol generating procedure, a deep suction where you're gonna produce little fine particles that travel into the air. That's a different type of activity. It doesn't happen on a regular everyday life. For instance, when we do a gen an aerosol generating procedure in a closed, negative pressure room, um, if we have to move that patient, we cannot put another patient in there for another three hours because the air is still being filtered and circulated and those particles might still be up in the air. But that's for aerosol generating procedures. The, the cruise ship that you're talking about, 17 days. There were a lot of people who were sick on that cruise ship. They, they, I don't know if they had diarrhea, they could have, um, they were coughing, they were spitting, they were vomiting, they were whatever they, were, they had, right? That cruise ship was full of COVID and they had flat, hard surfaces, tables, um, you know, bed, bed rails, uh, doors, doorknobs, etc. Of course, if nobody is going to go in and fumigate a cruise ship, if before you fumigate the cruise ship and you start to swab all over the place, you're going to find COVID on, the, on these surfaces for days afterwards. This is not something that we will encounter in a, in a controlled hospital environment because the cleaning is different. I don't know what kind of cleaning they did on the, on the cruise ship. But, you know, we have professional medical cleaners that know how, what to clean, etc. And it's not going to happen in a regular house because in a regular house, one, two people might be sick. You're going to clean that place. You know how to, if you clean it properly, then your doorknobs and your handles and your tables are going to be clean. But if you, you know, if you walk around with a, with a duster like this, then that's not going to clean anything. So it all has to do with how good that, that cruise ship was cleaned. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. Good, thank you. And what about, this is the last one on, on social media, Can, well, the last one that I know of. Can drinking alcohol, people are drinking disinfectants or antiseptic, kill the virus? No, if you, want to get, if you want to kill your kidneys or go blind because you're drinking wood alcohol or something like that, then uh, you can go ahead and do that. But uh, no, the, it's BS. It's internet BS. There's a lot of internet BS. Garg anything, anything that has to do with natural gargling things or super high doses of vitamins or uh, you know swallowing cleaning products in mr clean or whatever it's all bs um there's no science or anything behind that and it's irresponsible and it's dangerous uh there was another question i think we had discussed can you get the virus twice that's I a very good ask you that yes there's, it's a very good question um there are a couple of cases of people who tested positive then negative then positive again we don't know if that negative is a true negative um, and or if these people have a problem with their immune system where they don't get a memory. But we are not technically seeing that in many, many cases. So my answer is a tentative no. You can't get the virus twice this year. I don't know next year if it mutates or not. Okay. And what can it stay dormant in a, in a non-symptomatic person and then reappear, I don't know, weeks, months later? No, not months. The incubation period, the longest incubation period, this is why we use 14 days, because when we looked at the original people who got sick in China and traced them back to where they were 
um, uh, two weeks before, uh, then in that market, then it was about 14 days. But the vast majority of patients who get sick are between three and five days after getting uh, infected. So the virus incubates and then it comes out. And it can incubate and come out 14 days later because there was a few cases in China. So this is where we have that 14 day rule. Okay. But more than that, more than that, no, there's no incubation in you for like days and days and days and days and months. Okay, perfect. I think we covered everything, right? Was there something else in the beginning you had asked? Uh, there was something that you wanted to ask me afterwards? There was a new question that did that, that was a new question that had come up or did we answer it? I think we answered it. Uh, no, I think we answered it. It was about the uh, pneumonia, the, uh, the vaccine with the- Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, uh, I think we did cover everything. Um, when do you think we'll reach our peak? When, wh wh where's our hope here? Where's the peak for people not to get scared? You know, approximately when will the peak be? For people to understand that the numbers will rise and not too yeah. and the peak and will be, I think, two weeks after we we started the emergency measures and the social distancing. So, you know, we've kind of ramped up and up and up and up. It wasn't like a boom, uh, and then two weeks later and see what happens. We've kind of like you know just just two days ago he closed the malls and, but let's see what happens next week, which would be the second week that we are in uh, lockdown or semi-lockdown. Let's see what happens with the numbers there. We're holding, we're hoping that we were able to control this. And how long is this is going to last? I don't know. I don't know. We might go on for another month, month and a half like this. Okay. And what is a message of hope you can give us with all this? Is there something? There's always we hope. There's the, always the hope. Light. We yeah, we will get through this. There are treatment protocols that are very promising. Uh, vaccines are being created. Um, summer is coming. The numbers might go down. Uh, we all have to keep hope, and hope dies last. Absolutely. And as a cancer survivor, I'll tell you 100%. You're right. Um, so my message to everybody is be safe, uh, be prudent, uh, protect your loved ones, protect your elderly, uh, wash your hands. Do not touch your face. Uh, and there you go. We'll thank get through this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking this time to, to, to answer all of our questions. And please. Thank you. We could do this again, you know, with an update in a couple of weeks or a week. And uh, we'll see. Perfect. Thank you. And keep safe. And thank you to all of our heroes. You're all our heroes. We try our best. We, we, we're not, you know, I, I, I hate that word hero. We're all heroes. Um, but uh, we try our best, we humans. Be well.